Terry uh, is, and I don't want to brag on her behalf, but quite a big deal in the ex Jehovah's Witness community. Um, she uh, co-runs the UK ex Jehovah's Witness meetup and support group, um, and uh, does other. So she's your proper activist, Terry. Um, and you're connecting people and doing what's, what I'm increasingly realising is actually very important work for people who are leaving and waking up. There really is a transition period between leaving and, uh, and living a normal life. And because I, I never had that, I faded away. I think there's, there's a real value in signing the letter and saying, I'm out. Um, there is also a cost to that in terms of your family. And I decided I didn't want, the cost was too high for me and I just couldn't do it. Um, and I think there are different strategies that are right for different people, and I don't think we should judge each other for which ones we take, frankly. You know your own world and you know your own mental health. Um, but I'm realising I did pay a price for never formally cussing, because you're always a bit attached, and I didn't have enough support. So I think, what, Terry, what you're doing, and what everybody here is doing today is, is incredibly important. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Terry <laughs> Yeah, so, so my story, I, my mother became a Jehovah's Witness when I was seven years old. She joined with my grandmother and um, us four girls. Um, and straight away, once you become a Jehovah's Witness, your whole life revolves around that religion. Um, so you've got your three meetings a week, you've got your preparations for the meetings, you've got your daily texts you've got to read every morning, um, you've got to go on the ministry, you've got to prepare for the ministry. It's, it's constant. You, you don't have time to be anything other than a Jehovah's Witness, really. Um, um, we, we'd come from, prior to that, my mum had left my dad in the middle of the night. My dad was quite a violent person. So we'd already had a life of fear. Um, and once we became Jehovah's Witnesses, we had all these new friends every, uh, you know, that were in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they were good people, nice people. Um, and uh, so then there wasn't that fear of violence anymore. Um, but then my mum met somebody else who was a, um, in the Jehovah's Witnesses. He was a ministerial servant and he was really strict. He was really, you know, um, strong in the faith, as they'd say. Um, which meant that now, not only did we have all the meetings, all the preparation for the meetings, and the Bible textbook and all, all the rest of it, um, we now had a group Bible study and we had individual Bible studies. Um, and because uh, as a child I really, um, I think it's just fundamental to who I am, had a lot of questions. My mum used to take my Bible study, bearing in mind eight years old, right? And um, uh, I'd ask questions, um, you know, what about the dinosaurs? Um, stuff like that, <laughs> you know, and you're not supposed to ask questions. Now, even as a kid, you're not supposed to ask questions because it's all true. And if you question it, um, you're saying Jehovah's a liar. And we all know what happened to Nimrod. Actually, I can't remember what did happen to Nimrod. <laughs> <laughs> we all know what happened to Nimrod. What, what, does anyone remember? But, uh, yeah, I remember. What uh, so what I used to get told all the time as a kid, I was like, Nimrod, because he was questioning Jehovah. So what did happen to Nimrod? Does anyone remember? What was that? It was Babylon. They built Babylon, oh. and uh, everybody then knew language. Well, that's already happened. That's <laughs> yeah. not much of a threat when you're eight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if anyway. You're, if, you don't, if you don't listen to Jehovah, you <coughs> make everyone in the family speak a different language. And that's <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But, um, so... Then um, our, our lives basically, I'd say my childhood was about fear and disconnection um, because we were constantly, I think the others have talked about Armageddon. Armageddon is coming next week and it's been coming next week for the last 100 years. <laughs> and, but, they, but, the, but they refresh it constantly and you talk about it all the time. And there's, you get the Watchtown Awake magazine. If the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door next time, just take the magazines. They don't come again. Get magazines and have a look at the pictures inside. They will come they again. They are terrible. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They're gonna come again. Um, have a look inside. There will undoubtedly be a picture 
of people like this in fear because um, there's hailstones and uh, this size and fire coming down from heaven. Everyone who's not a Jehovah's Witness, there's only 8 million of them. So everyone in this room, you're all going to die. So when you're 8 years old, you are told in great detail all the different ways that everybody's going to die. You know, all your neighbours are going to die, everybody you know at school, they're all going to die. And all your relatives who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses, they're going to die. Um, and uh, different ways that you can die, you can get killed by Jehovah. You can have crows peck your eyes out. I remember getting told all about that. Eight years old, they tell you that kind of crap. Um, um, yeah, it's, and it's terrifying. I used to have nightmares all the time. Um, and uh, you, you're constantly in trouble for little minor infractions. Um, whatever it is you're in trouble for, you're going to die at Armageddon for that. You know, tell kids for just that you do, do your tr shoelaces up. You're going to die at Armageddon for that. Um, sh shit like that, basically. It's pretty crappy. Um, and so it, you, you live in fear all the time. When I was about 11 years old, 12 years old, something like that, my older sister, who was 18 then, she got disfellowshipped and, uh, because she fell in love, basically. Um, and he'd been married before, but like they talked about, he hadn't had a scriptural marriage. Um, so he wasn't free to marry, but they loved each other. So um, she got, they both got disfellowshipped. Um, they're still together 20 years later. Um, and have two children um, and he's now an elder uh, because they sat at the back of the Kingdom Hall for five years with everybody ignoring them. Five fucking years. They had to sit at the back of the Kingdom Hall and we sat at the front of the Kingdom Hall and we weren't allowed to talk to them. And if we look back there's your sister, you're 12 years old, sitting at the back of the Kingdom Hall. She has to come to the meeting late because no one's allowed to talk to her beforehand, so you don't want to have an accidental hello. So she's got to come late and sit at the back of the Kingdom Hall. And before the last prayer said, she's got to leave so that no one accidentally says hello to her. Um, so the only way we got to see our sister was to turn around and have a look at her at the back of the Kingdom Hall but we get told off for looking at her. Um, and you get reminded of Lot's wife who looked back and she got turned into a pillar of salt. So we got told we were going to die at Armageddon for looking at my sister. Um, so, yeah, anyway, five years later, I guess I was about 18, uh, something like that anyway by then, she got reinstated. But I didn't know my sister. Who was she? I've gone through my whole childhood, don't know her. Um, and I still don't know her because I left the witnesses and now she doesn't talk to me. Um, and I was 20 when I left. And I, like I said before, put in a 90-hour field service report because I was a regular pioneer the month before. And I was just like, the meetings are boring. They're run by window cleaners. Um, and they're boring. And they say the same thing over and over again. And um, I wasn't allowed an education, but, you know, quite intelligent, <laughs> listening to window cleaners talking every week. It is boring. Um, so one day, our, uh, my mum was skiving off the meeting, pretending she was ill, um, and so I was to drive, because I was a good, you know, I was a really good job, so I was going to drive myself to the, to the Kingdom Hall, and I didn't go to the Kingdom Hall, I said, see you later mum, I'll tell sister so and so, you send your love, and I drove to Stratford, and I put my Robbie Williams uh, tape on in the car and listened to Let Me Entertain You uh, for two hours. Right, the meeting will probably be finished around about now. And then I uh, went home and said, Sister so-and-so sent a love. Um, 
and uh, yeah, and that, I think my mum suspected something was up, and um, one day she said, that's it, I want you out of the house. My younger sister, who was in the middle of doing her A-levels, two years younger than me, she had to leave as well, so we both got kicked out of house. She hadn't even done anything. Was uh, it because she was doing A-levels, though? Because that's a bit yeah. dodgy. Well, she'd stopped going to the meetings when she was 15. She, she used to get away with stuff. She was... She was uh, <laughs> yeah, but... Um, yeah, so basically, we were kicked out of home. Um, coincidentally, I'd... Um, uh, been made redundant from my part-time job um, so we were homeless um, moneyless jobless um, no income and didn't have it like everyone else says you're not allowed friends outside of the witnesses so we didn't, didn't have anyone my sister moved in with a school teacher she was applying to go to university a school teacher said she could come and stay in her spare room and a guy at work that had a bit of a crush on me because um, I still had a few weeks left of my job before my redundancy happened uh, said well you could come and stay with me I was quite lucky he was a nice guy really because uh, I was pretty naive pretty stupid um, and uh, yeah so, so she didn't set you guys up in a flat and go okay now you have to sort yourself out no. She just let you go homeless? No, the bin liners are there. See ya. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's what happened. But all of these people are just ordinary people who are obviously massively brainwashed. This is yeah. why I say it's a cult. It can't be we've all got families and friends who, like, it, it, they're massively, massively brainwashed by a cult. And it's, it's, it's not just, so you're here, we'll get ostracised from your family and lose everyone. And when I said at the beginning my childhood was about fear and disconnection, it's, you, the whole religion is about disconnection. So while you're not allowed friends outside of the religion, get this, you, there are witnesses within the religion that aren't good enough for you. They're not spiritual enough. So don't talk to sister so-and-so. She's, she's spiritually weak. Um, you don't talk, play you can with talk to brother. Her to encourage her. You can but encourage you, her, but don't socialise. But don't her. don't you know go to her house for dinner or anything because she's spiritually weak, and and yeah, you can encourage brother so and so's children. But I saw him wearing a designer T-shirt, so he's probably a bit worldly. Um, <laughs> so you probably shouldn't hang out with well. him either. And he's a boy, so you shouldn't talk to him either anyway. <laughs> um, you're constantly spying on each other, and they're spying on you. Um, and it's just nasty. You just, you're constantly in fear of everything and everyone. Well, people report each other, you and people report, report themselves. And you report yourself if as I'd, well. If I'd read 1984 before I become a journalist, mm. I never would have, because it's all, everything, it's new speak, it's people, it's you have to love Big Brother. And yeah, you, do. you do. You go and you, you ring up someone like Nick. Yeah, you would. And you go, oh, you know, I've just had an hour of my vibrator. And, you know, it, <laughs> I wouldn't have a vibrator, Nick. Don't worry. I would never have said that. But it's that, it's you, you report yourself, you report other people. Pe yeah. Other people go, oh, I was reported on loads. I was a pioneer. And I reported other people. Because yeah, I was I genuinely, not because I was like, telling on them because I was genuinely worried that somebody who was we were really close young people together that they were going to be weak in the truth because they we'd seen them and they'd had a few drinks or something and we yeah. were just like genuinely worried that they were, we were going to lose them to the world yeah. so it was it was uh, you know f f f sisters brothers flatmates would would report each other all the time and he, and not even that the witnesses make up their own rules as well. So, it, so there's already a lot of rules within the religion that you can get disfellowship for. And then there are uh, conscious, conscience matters, which means you'll get looked down upon if you do that, but you won't get disfellowship. It's not really a disfellowship in um, sin, but it's not really... It's, you've shown yourself to be not very spiritually strong. Um, but then the witnesses just make their own ones up as well. Like, different congregations have ideas on white socks. That was literally a thing. Like, yeah. Oh, never, I Did never you not that, get the white no. sock one? Yeah. So a brother wore white socks under his suit trousers and gave a talk. 
And that was like, what I can is sort of he see doing? It. Yeah, what is I can sort doing? of see it. Now you say it, I go, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. that would have been commented on. And Smurfs I remember was the one I remember. Smurfs. But if yeah. you had little Smurf toys, they were demonised. And so you, demonized. Did, you definitely were in the truth if you let your children have Smurfs. Yeah, you couldn't and have Smurfs. Uh, because there was a story that Smurfs had walked out of the meeting. Yeah, a Smurf <laughs> jumped off a table once, so that... <laughs> <laughs> that went round the whole yeah, yeah, world. Yeah, that was like there was so always open myths, weren't there? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, a friend of mine had some strappy sandals. A, uh, a female friend of mine, she had some strappy sandals, and an elder's wife had a conversation with her about that. I mean, flat sandals. She had a long skirt on, modest clothes, but they were strappy. And and even amongst us, we sort of thought. No, I was we from Australia. I, we don't there get this. <laughs> we just, strappy sandals were the only yeah. thing anyone wore because it was 40 degree heat. But I tell you what, we did get once. The, we had a horrible circuit over here, who I'm happy to name as Les Simmons. And he destroyed, destroyed happy, sort of the, you know, relatively happy congregations and families with his draconian ways. And all the pioneers, all kind of young, young very loved up, supporting each other, really believed, you know, really enthusiastic. And we had him over for dinner, which would normally go to families. But we said, well, we're like a young family of pioneers. And we saved up to make him a nice meal, because obviously we had no money. And he and his wife came in, and we decided to do it at the boys' house, because we're all, like, you know, 19 or something. And we did it at the boys' flat, because it was, um, it, they had a bigger kitchen. And when the, pi- when the brother and sister Simmons turned up, we'd set the table, and we were sort of finishing off the last things, coming in and out. And uh, we thought it had gone really well. We're so pl- proud of ourselves for doing it. And then the next day, we were all holding into the back room as a gr- group of pioneers. And he, said, um, and he said, I was horrified by what I saw last night. And we were like, oh, what? What? And he was like, you sisters just walking into those young brothers' kitchens, and you just, uh, you just knew where their cutlery was. You're so familiar. <laughs> we were like, well, it's, it's where everyone's cutlery is. It's just in the top drawer. Like, it just doesn't take a... <laughs> I mean, what? Where would us want it to be? Who keeps their country in a shoebox under the bed? And, and uh, he was like, you're over-familiar, and I don't want to see you mixing together anymore. The girls can pioneer together, the sisters can pioneer together, and the brothers can pioneer together. You, and, and he pointed at his sister and said, look at that strappy, because she had a sort of sundress on, because it was 40 degrees. And, she, and he said, look at that shoulder. That young brother there, pointing at some poor embarrassed virginal boy, who's, you know, 21 and trying not to wank, and, um, <laughs> and he said, that poor brother there, do you understand what sexual urges he has? You don't. It's very difficult for the young brothers when young sisters dress like this. And, this, and everyone just freezes. And it's just like, because I didn't even know penises got erect till I saw one. You know, I knew nothing. So, and I, so I, we were all sitting there going, what? What are you saying? Don't talk about sex. We never talk about sex. We never look at each other. And we were all so naive and innocent. And we got totally told off. And do you know what else we got told off for? What? Having holidays, taking your pioneer holiday where you have a week off. You can't afford to go anywhere, but you know, you've just done your hours sort of thing. And we, we would have our week off in the summer, which wasn't the American summer. The American summer ended in August. So the pioneering year ended in August. Yeah, yeah. And we would take ours in summer because we were in Australia. And so it doesn't matter what hemisphere you're in. You put your, your holidays in August. I don't care if it's the middle of winter. That's what Jehovah, that's Jehovah's loving arrangement. Like, well, could Jehovah please lovingly arrange for the sun to come out in August in Australia? No, you, it'll do you good. It's good discipline. Um, yeah. Stuff like that. That, yeah. that was totally random. Make up stupid rules. But yeah. that was very specific. Like that was he was worse than yeah. most of the others. But I do remember that sort of embarrassment that you know something like strappy sandals suddenly yeah, would be banned. Yeah, become and, a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they didn't even need to be involved in the elders. That was just some random sister in the congregation. She invented that rule. You know. um, yeah, just stuff like that. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, I left, I left when I was 21, like I said, um, and um, got cut off and everything like that, like everybody else said. But in 2007, um, I, I, like Deborah Mitchell, set up a group um, on Meetup. Uh, dot com for ex Jehovah's Witnesses to meet up, and uh, it started in the back room of a library uh, in Rochester Strood, which was glamorous. <laughs> uh, just because we were really scared of bumping into real, uh, like current Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and eventually we just started meeting up in a pub and stuff like that. And anyway, uh, I now co-run it with Steve, who's brilliant. Um, I say co-run it, he pretty much does everything actually. Um, um, and we've got over 600 members. Steve does some brilliant tours of the British Museum and the Science Museum. 
uh, where he'll talk about the Bible history and the evidence for evolution and things like this. Uh, we have a big Christmas dinner because uh, obviously Jehoshaphat does celebrate Christmas. So every Christmas, and we've had na- nine so far, um, we, you know, invite as many ex Jehovah's Witnesses as you can. can bring Nick your partners. Tree. Can I bring my tree? You can bring <laughs> your tree. And uh, we do that in Vauxhall in London. And um, the pubs, you know, they, they know us now and they give us our big table for us to sit on. And they give us an extra table to put all our presents on. We do like a secret set. So everybody brings with them a gift, they wrap up, you know, so it's been like five or something. Um, and then at the end we uh, swap the presents around but it's hilarious because um, none of us know the rules and we're like we sit there and like some people they've only left like a few months ago the religion like so Christmas crackers what do you do with these (laughs) (laughs) and then like we had you know people always fuck it up and get the rules wrong (laughs) like this time people were like I'm I'm trying to make it a tradition that we all do it together in a row like this at the end like uh, as we're getting our our dip the main course come through but undoubtedly some people have gone do you want just let's just us do it it?" (laughs) yeah it's just stuff like that you just just need more rules for them yeah (laughs) (laughs) Maybe they could respect the arrangement. <laughs> Take them so, aside and t- talk about running ahead of the cracker organisation. That's it, yeah. Yeah, you can get disfellowship for not doing the crackers um, right. Um, and then I uh, just want to say um, on this panel that we've got here, that um, everybody's said their story, but everyone's an, an activist that goes out of their way to help people who are newly out. The work that Mark and Cora do is unparalleled. They are constantly online talking to people and helping people. They will drive out and meet people. They give out their phone number um, to people. Uh, They've helped people who are on the brink of suicide and are homeless and things like that. Nick, he's he's doing the same as helping people online. We've got people in the audience who are constantly doing the same as well. We're all, we're all doing, Lydia's helping people as well. Um, so people are watching this at home on YouTube. If you've only just left, or if you left like 10 years ago and you're now thinking, oh, I've got to research this organisation for the first time in my life. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of us out here, so connect with us. Um, you'll find us on Facebook. We're all pretty loud. Um, <laughs> ranting a bit, um, a lot. Um, there's a lot of support out there, so um, if you feel like you're alone and you haven't got any friends because no one's talking to you anymore, there's loads of us, thousands of us, to so get in touch. Thank you. Thank you.